Well, it's good to be here with you this morning as we get to uh, sing together and pray together and be encouraged together as we encourage one another, as we comfort one another. And this morning, we will be in a different passage. We will take a little break from walking through Ephesians. We'll come back after the new year, and we're going to spend the next three weeks meditating on, on some of the themes that are often so common during this time of year, of uh, Christ's birth, and uh, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us as individuals, for us as a church? What does it mean for the, the world? Uh, and then with New Year's, how ought we to experience and how ought we to celebrate this, this, this new beginning, this new year, and what that looks like for us as Christians? So I think the next three weeks will be edifying, I pray, and, and enjoyable. And, and all of that, the interesting thing is that a lot of what we've been learning in Ephesians will play into what's going on because Ephesians is such a broad view on the call, what God has called us, done for us, and called us to do for Him. Uh, let us pray, and then we will and, uh, begin our study. Father, We acknowledge that we, uh, we are nothing, we can do nothing apart from you. We can do nothing apart from the life that you have. There is no life outside of you, and there is no light outside of you. And that all the good that we can do, and all that's worthy, we can only do because of you. And I pray that this morning you would fill us with your spirit, that we would have eyes to see have ears to hear and hearts to believe and minds to understand the amazing things you have done in the past, what you are doing today, and what you promise to do tomorrow. Help us to trust and to obey. Please give us clarity of mind and give me clarity of mind and of speech that we would, that we would just marvel and wonder at the beauty of what it is you have done and who it is that we celebrate in this time of year. And it's in His name, in the name of him, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So as I was considering what it is that we should focus on these three weeks, I was thinking of the common phrases that we often hear. Yesterday we went out uh, caroling, and on Tuesday we will go again. And several of the Christmas songs that we sing have this common refrain, something to do with this, Christ is born. Christ is born on Bethlehem, Christ is born of Mary. Remember in Luke, the, the angels announced the shepherds, for a Savior is born, Christ is born, and, and oftentimes we will even have Christmas cards, right? Christ is the reason for Christmas, and Christmas, and Christ is born, and we celebrate His birth. And, and oftentimes, as it is the case when we use language and words so frequently, we might forget what those words mean. Or we might actually think they mean something else, and we might use them incorrectly. And in this case, if we forget what it means for Christ to be born, it doesn't just affect how we celebrate our holiday, it affects how we live everyday life. And so what I would like for us to do this morning is to ask a simple question. A question that every time we sing the songs, every time a song is played on the radio, people ask, sometimes consciously, sometimes deep subconsciously. And the question is this, who's that? Christ is born, we sing, we write in our banners, and yet oftentimes the question is, who's that? And it's funny because when I thought of this, I had a very limited, I was like, of what does it mean to ask that question? But the more I thought about it, and I realized there's several ways of saying that question right now. That's the danger with sending a text message. Sometimes you send a text message and you might mean it one way, but the person might read it completely another way because the tone of voice that you use indicates, or the, the body gestures that you use indicate what you mean by the thing you're saying. So we could read it something like this. Someone hears, Christ is born, and they might say, who's that? Very oblivious. Never heard 
as so many around us. I never heard. They don't know. Christmas to them is just about a fat man wearing a red suit and about gifts coming down the chimney or a red-nosed reindeer. Who is that? They might ask. And they might even, they might say it genuinely. Christ. Who's that? Tell me more. Maybe just like you, when someone tells you of their favorite music, musician, for example, say, hey, you know a song I really like? Ricky Nelson, I Will Follow You. And some of you might know who I'm talking about, but others might say, Ricky Nelson? Who's that? Is he even alive? And some of you would say, Ricky Nelson, are you kidding me? The sweetest voice of the 60s or 70s, I don't know when that was. 50s? <laughs> My goodness. The, uh, what's funny, because I, I do like Ricky Nelson, so don't blame me. Uh, as I do like Elvis, like we sang yesterday, Blue Christmas in some of the, the homes. Um, so some people might respond like that. Who is that? Tell me more. Oblivious. They've never heard. And maybe some of you are, were, were like that once. You had never heard. You heard Christ is born, Christ is born, but you didn't really understand. What does that mean? Now, others might respond a little bit different, right? Christ is born, they hear, and they said, who is that? As in, who cares? I've heard about that, but that's not a big deal. Who is that anyways? He's not worthy of my time, of my reflection. We might call that maybe the skeptical person. Uh, Christ? I don't want anything to do with him. Who is that anyways? Like somebody might say of a political leader. and would say, such and such person is doing a wonderful... Him? Who is he anyways? He's a nobody. Somebody might ask that question. Somebody might actually ask someone who knows. Someone might say, they hear Christ is born. And someone who knows Christ might say, yes, but I want to know more. Who is that? Tell me more. Who is he? I want to know more about who he is. And maybe some of you are in that situation. Tell me more about who Christ is. And I think last are some people who, <clears throat> when they hear, when they see the blue snowflakes falling, then the blue memories start calling. And they, while everyone is having a white Christmas, they have a blue Christmas, like the song says. And they hear the familiar tune, Christ is born, and they say, Christ is born? Who is that anyways? Almost like an old friend that used to be close, but now, or I used to hear stories about him, fairy tales when I was a young boy, like I did of several other fantastical feature, uh, creatures. Christ is born. Who is that? Who cares? You see, when we proclaim words like this, Christ is born, we need to understand that for however many people are hearing, there might be a different response, a different understanding. What does it mean for Christ to be born? And maybe that person is completely oblivious. They've never heard. Or maybe they are so filled with anger that like the atheists or like the skeptical, they might say, I don't want anything to do with that. Who is that anyways? Or maybe they're the person who feel disappointed. I used to hear these stories. I used to be a choir boy, like one of the gentlemen we went to sing songs to yesterday. I used to be a choir boy. But who is that Christ anyways? Because while people are having white Christmas, I'm having a blue Christmas. So if you're in the background of that, I asked, we asked this. This is one of the guys we take... Meals on Wheels too, and we asked him, hey, is it okay if we go caroling at your house? And he says, you can do as you please. There's only one song I, I like hearing in Christmas. That's Blue Christmas by Elvis Presley. I was like, well, we'll sing that for you. That's fine. And Kim led us magnificently, and the rest of us followed. <laughs> And after we sang the song, and we went back to our cars, Harold was inside with him, and, and then went back inside, and, and we asked him, and said, hey, how do we do? He said, you did good. He said, did you listen? To, he asked us, did you listen to the lyrics? I said, yeah, I did. And he says, it, when you pay attention to those lyrics, it touches you deep down. Because Christmas isn't the same for everybody. As some of you here this morning are asking that same question. Christ is born? Who is that anyways? As you celebrate Christmas, perhaps the first Christmas, the third, the fifth, the 25th Christmas without a loved one. My grandmother, for example, will be celebrating her 40, 
Third, 50. Wait a second. 43rd Christmas without her husband. And he loves her. She, she loves him still. And remembers him. And misses him. And it's been 43 years. And so when we go out into the world and we proclaim Christ is born, we need to understand people don't always hear that the same way. And if our job is, like Paul has been speaking in Ephesians, to be the ones through whom the world knows who Christ is, then we need to know who Christ is. And we need to know Christ as much in all the different features, in all the different assets, all the different aspects, just like a diamond, the different cuts. Because Christ, if He really is who He claims to be, then He will have an answer for that oblivious person. He will have an answer for that skeptical atheist person who, who doesn't want anything to do with Him. He will have an answer for the one who is eager to learn more about Him. And He'll have an answer for the one who perhaps used to hear of Him, but is just disappointed in blue. And I couldn't think of a better passage than the one I just read while Kim was singing, which is kind of funny how that works. She asked me to read that passage this morning. I was like, hey, that's the one I'm preaching on. That's good. Isaiah 9. So if you would please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. As we ask this question, who is this? Who is Christ? As you're turning there, the first thing we need to understand, which is very interesting because this passage doesn't say Christ at all. It doesn't say the word Christ. The first thing we need to understand <laughs> is that Christ is much more than a name. It's much more than just a name. But we often use it as just like a name. Right? All glory be to Christ, our King. We use it like a name. But it's much more than just a name. Very much like our friend Harold, who's from Pocomo, if you didn't know, he's the mayor of Pocomo. <laughs> right now, a lot of the people who, the, all, a lot of the, the voters who voted him in are, are uh, hibernating. But in springtime, they'll come out, and those are, those are the squirrels from Squirrel Drive, where he runs his kingdom. But Harold is the mayor of Pocomo. Now let me ask you this, the word mayor, is that a title, or is that a name? I could say, hey, Mr. Mayor, couldn't I? Just like I could say, Mr. President. That's very much what Christ is. Christ is not just a name. In fact, it's a title. A title like we would use, Mayor, President, Ambassador, Teacher, Professor. It's a title that represents something. Now the question is, what does Christ mean? Anybody know? What does Christ mean? This is where you participate. What's the title? <laughs> voluntold. Voluntold. Christ. It's a translation of a word. Anybody know? Okay, yeah, that's, that's right. So, so our English word, Christ, comes from the Greek word, Christos. Which is very interesting because when the translator which, when the translator were translating the English Bible, which was the first English translation was the King James, there were a few pieces that came into that. But anyways, they translated most of it from Greek, the, Greek, the New Testament, from Greek into English. But when they came to certain words, they didn't translate it. They just left it like it was in the Greek. So when they went to translate Christos, instead of translating it into English, they just left it as Christ. And so we are, what in the world is that? But what the word Christos means is a Greek translation. Because when the New Testament authors wrote, they wrote in Greek. But their scriptures were written in Hebrew. And so when they were speaking about the Old Testament scriptures that were written in Hebrew, they would use the word Christos, because everybody would understand what Christos meant in Greek. But the word they were translating from Hebrew was Messiah. Christos is the Greek translation of Messiah. And everybody who spoke Hebrew knew what Messiah meant. And oftentimes our, our English translations will write Messiah. But once again, that's a Hebrew word. What does it mean? It's like in Brazil. That's called, instead of translating, that's called transliterating. 
Because instead of translating, you just take the original word and you just pronounce it as if it belongs to your language. In Brazil, we do that a lot. So whereas in, in Spanish-speaking country, the little mouse for your computer, and I remember those back in the day, the little tail, the little mouse, we, they call it little mouse, like ratinho. Okay? But in Brazil, we don't call it hachinho, which is little mouse, we call it mousy. Give me the mousy. Okay? Or keyboard. Instead of translating keyboard into teclado, which some people do, they just say keyboard. That's transliterated. But what does it mean? You see, Christ and Messiah mean something. Anybody know? I'll give you a hint. Even the English word has some times taken on this meaning. When some Christian traditions, they take a baby and they dip special water on it. What's it called? They are christening. Right? They're christening. What does that mean? Christening. Once again, what does that mean? I don't know. Which it's, it's actually just a word that means anointing. It means you are taking, in that time, an oil, and you're anointing that, purpose, that person for a special purpose. This would happen in the Old Testament, if you remember, with the kings. King Saul was anointed. King David was anointed. Samuel went and poured oil over his head. This represented that this individual was chosen for a purpose. So when we speak of Christ, we are speaking, we should say, the anointed one is born. Every time when you read in your Bible and you read either Messiah or Christ, you should read in your head, the anointed one. So much so is this the case, that if you keep your finger there in Isaiah, and you turn back to the New Testament, to John chapter 20, keep your finger, your tab, or if you're on your phone, I'm not sure how that works. Just go back to it. But let's go to John chapter 20, and the verse 30 in chapter 20. <clears throat> John, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament, and then chapter 20, verse 30. Here, John is going to tell us why he wrote what he wrote. Listen to what he says. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So let's use our understanding now. These are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the anointed one. He is the chosen one. And notice what he goes on to say. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You see, according to John, the answer to this question is the most important question you will ever ask in your life. Who is Christ? Because he says, i written this so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ. Does that make a little bit of sense? Jesus is the anointed one. So now we have to ask, anointed for what? And this is where Isaiah 9 is going to come in. So turn back with me to Isaiah 9. Jesus, the anointed one, the Son of God, John tells us, the Christ. And what is he anointed for? Turn to Isaiah 9 and look at verse 6. This is normal where we pick up reading. Verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. You see where John is picking that up from? The Son of God? He understands Jesus to be this one. For to us, a son is given. But before we move on, there's another important thing we must see. Look at verse 6 and how it begins. What's the first word in verse 6? Who's got it? What's the first word in verse 6? Four. Four. Now, Kim, you're a literature person. If the first word in a sentence is for, should you start reading? Should you start reading there? If the first word in a sentence is for, I mean, technically, 
Or does it tell me that, I, that there are four... There's, there's got to be another brain system. There's got to be something before it. Yeah. Like, what is that for? There for. Because the word for, sometimes we'll use the word because, it's the same thing, for or because, is giving us a reason. For, unto us, a child is born. What's that for there for? And if we begin reading there, we will miss the whole thing. You see that? He is born, and him being born is the reason why whatever happened, happened. You see that? So we actually have to begin earlier. Begin with me in verse 1. And in some of your translations, it might actually be chapter 8, verse 23, where it says, there will be no gloom. And the King James has a very awkward translation for this. So just bear with me as, as we read that verse uh, 1 and 2, uh, verse 1, the last verse of chapter 8 and the first verse of chapter 9. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. You see, in the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And here's verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, for the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every brute boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burnt as fuel of the fire. For to us a child is born. You see that? What Isaiah is speaking of here, there's a people, verse 2, who walked in darkness. But a light has shone. Why? Because a child has been born. Look at verse 3. There was a place that needed multiplying, but it was multiplied. Why? Because a child was born. There was a place that needed joy. And joy increased. Why? Because a child was born. There was a place that needed a fruitful harvest and didn't have it. But now it has. Why? Because a child is born. And this joy is celebrating the glad of the divide, when they divide the spoil. There was a yoke of burden. There was a staff over someone's shoulder. There was the rod of an oppressor, an enemy that has been broken. Why? Because a child has been born. You see that? Now we ask, who is this people in darkness? Who is this people that are filled with sorrow and have no joy? Who are these people that are under the yoke and the staff of an enemy that need to be broken? Who are these people? And often we will jump straight, well, that's everybody, that's all humanity. Everybody is under darkness. Everybody is filled with sorrow. Everybody is under the burden of a staff and they need the good shepherd to come in and free them. And yes, that's true. But let's not skip an important step. Who is Isaiah speaking about? The people of Israel. And why is that important? A people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness. He's talking about the people of Israel. Why is that significant? Because who were the people of Israel? They were the chosen ones to bear God's light. They were the ones to be the children of Abraham who would bless all the nations. They were the ones who, from their land... They would bear fruit and bless the whole world. And here they are described as a land of deep darkness. In other words, this is as deep of a darkness as you can get. Not only are the nations corrupt, but even the so-called people of God were corrupt. Who can save us now? If the solution has been corrupted, like an ambulance going to rescue a car crash, and on the way gets in a wreck, who will save now? If the rescue team has now need to be rescued, 
how deep is that situation? How much more filled with darkness? And I think that speaks to our situation. That when we see somebody who is in super deep darkness, we might often give up. There's a crash. Oh, the ambulance is coming. Oh, no, now the ambulance. There's no hope. The ambulance crashed too. It's on fire. What will we do? Let's just give up. Oh, here's my neighbor who's rejected Christ for 73 years. Such a bitter old grouch. There's no hope for him. But look what he says on the people who walked in darkness. Not just any people. The people who not just rejected Jesus because they didn't know about him, but because they didn't like him. Not just the people who rejected because of ignorance, but the people who rejected because of rebellion. That's Israel. And yet on them, a light shines. Because a child has been born. And so we can learn from that. Who is this Messiah? Who is this anointed one? He is the one who brings light into the deepest of darkness. And it doesn't matter how deep the dark, His light will conquer. Just like John says in John 1, the light has come into the world and darkness cannot overcome it. If those who looked at God's face, at His light shining upon the temple, as His cloud filling the holy place, they saw that, the people of Israel. They saw the waters of the sea part. They saw the bread from heaven fall and they rejected Him. And yet God is still willing to shine His light on them. How much more on us? How much more on your child or on your sibling or on your friend? This is the Christ that's been born. The one who brings light into the deepest of darkness. Notice also, verse 4, The yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken. What Isaiah is talking about here is the nations of outside of Israel who were supposed to be blessed by Israel because Israel disobeyed, are now corrupting Israel. Not just corrupting, but taking them captive. At the time here, it was the Assyrian Empire. As the years would come, it would be the Babylonian Empire. Israel, from the days of the judges, had been handed from one person to the other, even though God said, you will be the blessing for the nations, but they failed to trust them. So they were under the control of the Midians, then they were under the control of the Persians, then they were under the control of the Egyptians, and then the Babylonians and the Assyrians, and they were always oppressed. And here's what God is saying, the yoke of the oppressor, the rod of the oppressor is broken. <clears throat> And what we understand here, as Isaiah is going to continue in his prophecy, is that all these kingdoms who are bringing judgment on, on, on Israel, they are controlled by a much stronger enemy. The very same enemy that Jesus stood face to face with in the wilderness. The same enemy, enemy that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 2, when he says, the prince, the power of the air. So we are not under the oppression of Assyria right now. But the reason they were under the oppression of Assyria then is because they were under the oppression of Satan. Just like our country is. Just like our neighborhoods are. Under the power of the prince of darkness. But notice, the rod of his oppressor, the rod of Satan is broken. Why? Because a child is born. Who is this Messiah? Who is this Christ? He is the one who defeats the enemy. He is the one who can conquer Satan's power. He is the one who can take the grips that Satan has on your loved one and freedom, just like he did to me and he did to you. The grips that Satan used of sin and selfishness and addiction to hold you as captive to his will. Because a child is born, his staff is broken. The yoke is lifted, and you are free. Who is this Christ? Who is this Messiah? He's the one who can shine light into the deepest of darkness, and He's the one who can free from the strongest of enemies. That's who our Christ is. And notice what will happen to this enemy. For Verse 5, Every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burnt as fuel for the fire. That's just describing a very vivid image of what will happen to the enemy. In fact, look at the end of verse 4. 
the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Now you may not remember that name, but I'm sure some of you will remember the name Gideon. Remember Gideon, the judge? If you are not familiar, you can look when you have some time in Judges chapter 7. The story of Gideon. At that time, Israel was being oppressed by the Midianites, the people from the east, which would be the people from Babylon, oppressing Israel. And yet, God raises up a man. His name was Gideon. And you remember how the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, Through you, Gideon, I will deliver my people. And Gideon said, Well, if you really are with me, God, please give me a sign. And you remember how he asked, I will leave a little carpet outside of my house. And if you're with me, let dew be on the carpet. But nowhere else. And then God does that. He says, Well, let me ask you one more. Okay, this time, let dew be everywhere except on the carpet. And God does. And so uh, Gideon believes. And he says, all right, you're with me. So Gideon collects a whole army of his people to face the Midianites. And he gets, I think, 20,000 people. And they're marching on the way to the valley. And God says this to Gideon. You remember? He says, Gideon, you have too many people. And Gideon's like, but, but the enemy, they're like the sands of the seashore. You can't even count them. And I have 20,000 people. I have too many people. And God says, you have too many people. Because if you win, you will think you did it by your own hand. But I will show that the victory is mine. And then he, what he tells Gideon to do is says, Tell the people this. If anybody is scared, if anybody is afraid, tell them to go back to their homes. And Gideon says that. And a few thousand leave. And then there's about 3,000 left, I think. I'm, I'm guessing on the numbers here, but it's about three or 10,000. And God says, there's still too many. And Gideon says, okay, what am I to do now? And God says this, go down, take your soldiers to the river and let them drink some water. And do you remember he says, some people knelt down and took water with their hand and drank from their hand like a dog. And some actually knelt down and drank straight from the river. And God says, see those 300 over there that drank like a dog from their hand? Those 300, they're the ones you're going to take. The other few thousand, send them back home. So, okay, 300 versus an army of potentially hundreds of thousands. And to make matters worse, remember the weapons that Gideon used. God said, all right, you're going to go face an army of hundreds of thousands with 300 men. Take your trumpet and a lamp. Remember that? Gideon is like, okay. So he takes the 300, he splits them into three groups. Here's the camp of the Midianites. He puts 100 here, 100 there, 100 here. And in the middle of the night, with torch in one hand and trumpet in the other, Gideon says, shout. And they all shout and blow their trumpets and slam their lamps on the ground. And the entire army of the Midianites, without the Israelites having to raise one finger of their sword, take themselves down. The army of the, Israel, the Midianites become so confused that they fight against each other and defeat themselves. And God shows his massive power. In other words, here's what he's saying. In the same way that God provided then, without Gideon having to use one of his fingers, except to blow a trumpet. That's how he's going to defeat the enemy. Not by your strength, unity, but because a child is born. Do you see that? That's our Messiah. The one who defeats the greatest of enemies. Doesn't matter what the odds look like. Who is our Messiah? Who is He? He's the one who light, shines light into the deepest of darkness. He's the one who defeats the strongest of enemies. And notice what He goes on to say. Verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government shall stick upon his shoulder. And how is he going to be able to do this? Shine light into the darkness? Defeat the greatest of enemies? Here's how. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. How can he shine the light into the darkness? Well, think about it. How did the darkness come about? Through sin, through rebellion, through failing to trust, to being led, rather than being led by the wisdom of God, being led by foolishness. 
Even from the garden all the way throughout history, God offering his wisdom and his ways and man and women saying no. And in doing so, just like Paul tells us in Ephesians, he says they rejected wisdom. They became fools. And here's how is he going to do this? Because the child who was born is the wonderful counselor, the one who can give wisdom to the biggest of fools. That's how, because he's a wonderful counselor. Who is this Christ that is born? He's the wonderful counselor, the one who can give wisdom even to the biggest fools. Even to the person that's wasted their whole life making one bad decision after the other, he can give wisdom because he's the wonderful counselor. Notice next. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. In fact, in some translations it might say the warrior God. The word for mighty is the same word that's used for a warrior. In other words, he's the one who has the strength not just to defeat the enemy, but the one who has the strength to give you strength. To give wisdom to the fools, to give strength to the weak, because he's the mighty God. Because it's one thing, if all the enemies out there are defeated, but if at the end of the day I don't have enough strength if I don't have enough strength to do the things I need to do, how, what good is that? But He is the mighty God, the wonderful counselor who gives wisdom to the biggest of fools. He is the mighty God who gives strength even to the weakest of people. And He is the everlasting Father. Now don't be thrown off here by our ideas of Trinity and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. And he's not saying that Jesus the Son is the Father. No, what he's saying is he is a Father. Just like if you read the rest of the book of Isaiah, Israel was meant to be Father to the fatherless, to be a husband to the widows. And our God is the Father to the fatherless. That's what he's saying there. He's the everlasting Father. The one who is comforting those who don't have a Father. How can he bring light into darkness? How can he defeat the enemy? Because he is the wonderful counselor who brings wisdom into the foolish world. He's the one who brings strength into the weak world because he's the mighty God. And he's the one who brings comfort to those who don't have it. Because he's the everlasting Father. And lastly, he is the Prince of Peace. In other words, he is the one who can give peace to those filled with despair. He is the one who can give peace to your heart as you perhaps are struggling with whether or not having a blue Christmas. And you feel the blue rain, the blue snowflakes, in our case, the blue raindrops. Recalling back blue memories. He is the Prince of Peace who can give you peace. He was the Prince of Peace who can defeat the Prince of Darkness. And He's the Prince of Peace that can give the peace we need. And notice how this Christ, this anointed one, this child who will bring light into the darkest of Darkness, who will bring joy into the biggest of sorrows, who will defeat the greatest of enemies, who gives wisdom to the biggest of fools, who gives strength to the weakest of all, who gives comfort to those that don't have a father or mother, who don't, who don't have comforting around them, who is, gives peace to those who are in despair. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. In other words, unlike the many people in our life that have played a little bit of these parts, I think of perhaps my, my grandfather who would give wise counsel, but he can't give me wise counsel now. He lost. He lost to death. He's with Jesus, but here in my life, he's, he's not here anymore. And some of you know, have loved ones that were there as the comforters for you, and they're, they're gone. But not the Prince of Peace, not the Everlasting Father, because of the government, of the increase of His government and of His peace, there will be no end. You will never have to face a time when the child who was born, when the Anointed One will not be with you. David says in the Psalms, he says, My father and my mother have forsaken me, but you, O Lord, will never forsake me. 
because of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. He will sit on the throne of David and of his kingdom. He will establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Unlike the best of parents, unlike the best of spouses, unlike the best of children who one day will no longer be with us, our King is with us still. And because He is with us, we know that those who are with Him will be united with us. From this time forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. That's what He said. So as we, as we understand this, as we see who is this Christ, who is that? He is the one who brings light into the deepest of darkness. Doesn't matter how dreadful the situation might be, He is the solution. He's the one who gives joy to the, those who are in sorrow. He's the one that gives victory over the strongest of enemies. I don't know what enemy you're facing, or perhaps your family members are facing, that you can point them to the Christ. But He can defeat that enemy. He's the one who, is, who gives wisdom to the fools. Perhaps you're having a hard time convincing your grandchild or your son or your daughter or your spouse or someone to stop making foolish decisions. Christ can give them counsel. Pray. Pray that God would give them wisdom and that He would use you as His vessel of wisdom. He's the one who can give comfort as the everlasting Father. So perhaps this... For some of you, this might be the first Christmas without a loved one, or the second, or third, or fourth, or fifth, or twenty-fifth. And it's okay to be sorrowful. It's okay to, to, to mourn. But know that as you mourn, mourn in the shoulders of the everlasting Father, of the one who will never forsake you. And know that the peace that this world needs does not come from this political party, from that political party, from this strategy, from that, but it comes from the Prince of Peace. So Christ is born. Who is that? Jesus is the Christ. And so as we finish, I want us to, I want us to think about this as we move forward this week to celebrate Christmas, the, the, the birth of the Christ. How are we celebrating it in a way that shows people who He is? Are we celebrating it in a way that shows Him to just be a little footnote on what really matters? Are we celebrating Christmas in a way that tells our children and our grandchildren and our friends to find comfort not in the Prince of Peace, but in the giving of gifts? How will we celebrate Christmas to show that Christ is born? We say He's the reason for the season, but how are we living it? The way we celebrate it, are we showing people to trust in Him? Or are we showing Him that He's just a little baby that doesn't need to be worried about? Do we really believe this? Do we really believe that Jesus is the Christ? When we see the corruption in our government, when we see things frustrating, when somebody cuts us off in the streets, do we seek to take matters into our own hands, or do we trust, no, Jesus is the Christ. He will bring justice. Vengeance is His. This is how we celebrate Christmas. I was talking to the kids the other day because they were talking about uh, Mackenzie was bringing up St. Nick. They talked about St. Nick in school and how he was a good man that gave gifts. And, and that's wonderful. And he was generous to the poor. And, and I said, that's, that's wonderful. And, and then I asked Mackenzie, but why, do you, why did St. Nicholas do those things? Because he believed that Jesus was the Christ. That's why he did those things. So how do we honor him? If we want to honor St. Nick, how do we honor him? By pointing people to him or by pointing people to the Christ that he served? And so I want to encourage you this week as you interact with your family members, with your grandchildren, it's fine to have a merry time. It's fine to sing songs. It's fine to give gifts. That's, that's fine. But let's do that in a way. Let's take advantage of this, of this season to show people Christ is born. And without Him, we have nothing. Without Him, there is no light. Without Him, there is no comfort. Without Him, there is no wisdom. Without Him, there is no peace. But with Him, we have all those things. 
So I pray you will take advantage of that situation this week and remind your family members and yourself that Christ is born. Because for unto us a child is born. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Because though we were in the deepest of darkness, you gave us your light in sending your Son. We thank you that though we were being led astray by foolishness and being held captive by the dark powers of sin and Satan, through him, because a child is born, we have freedom. Help us to live in this freedom and to point others to this freedom, that in Christ and in Christ alone can peace be found, comfort, wisdom, and light, and life. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.